Time Warp is found under the Time category, and this is a very complex effect. It's created by the Foundry, the same company that made Key Light. And this version of Time Warp is kind of a stripped down version of a larger set of tools that works across multiple pieces of software. Time Warp is the version we get with After Effects. Now this has the ability to use the same type of pixel blending as we have right here on our timeline with this frame blending button. If I click it once, it's standard frame blending. If I click it again, it's gonna switch it to pixel motion where After Effects attempts to artificially generate frames between frames. So when you're slowing footage down and there's no actual data between two frames, pixel motion will try to make pixel information where there is none. I'm gonna turn that off though, because Time Warp, if I apply it to my effect, has way more controls than just using frame blending. Clicking that on is all you can do down here, but the Time Warp effect gives you access to lots of fine-tuned controls. It's really complex, but we're gonna walk through it briefly. First of all, let me take off this speed and turn off the effect and just show you that this is a clip of a guy dancing down some stairs. There's a good range of motion and some good opportunities to slow it down a little bit. Now, obviously this was not shot at a higher frame rate. It's just 25 frames per second. So there's not a lot of information for me to deal with, but this little heel click right here might be a good spot to actually slow the footage down. But if I step one frame at a time, you can see there's just not that much information for this fast movement. But before we get to that, let's just talk about how we can actually slow footage down. If I turn the effect back on, it's defaulted to slowing the speed down by half. So this is going to play back at half speed. And you'll notice right away, it's actually doing a pretty decent job. It's very smooth. Unlike if I were to turn this off and just slow down the footage by stretching this out to 200%, this is very choppy. It's noticeably choppy because it's just repeating frames. I'm not using any kind of frame blending. I could turn this frame blend on and it will just kind of fade between those frames and have this more of a ghosting trail look. Doesn't look that great. Or I could turn pixel motion blur on and that will do a better job. Again, this is exactly the same as what the time warp effect is doing. So by default, we're getting the exact same result. But now I can go in and modify a lot of these settings. The first two controls are the method and adjust time by. So method is set to pixel motion, just like I said, but we can change it to frame mix, which again is just kind of repeating and blending those frames in or whole frames where it's really not doing any blending at all. It's just slowing everything down. I'm gonna leave this at pixel motion because that can produce some really convincing looking results. But the adjust time by is set to speed, meaning that we have a speed control. So at any point in my timeline, I can set it to whatever playback speed I want and ramp in and out between different speeds. If you'd rather think of this more like time remapping, if I were to just right click and go to time, enable time remapping, and you're used to this format right here, then you're probably gonna wanna adjust time by source frame. And this is going to switch to the source frame value, and now I'm not getting any playback. I actually have to set keyframes. So I'd set a keyframe here, go to the end of the clip, and then advance this forward. But I'm gonna have to find where that frame is in order to keep the playback consistent at 100% speed. Because of that, I think it's a little bit easier to think about it in terms of actual speed. So I'm gonna change this to be much faster. Let's say 200% at the beginning, and we'll get to a point that I wanna slow it down. And I'm just gonna play through this until I see a spot that I think might work. So he's taking some steps, and then he does this little slide. That might be a good spot to slow it down or ramp into slowing it down. So I'm gonna set a keyframe right here, again at 200%, press U to bring up my keyframes, zoom in a little bit closer and then go forward in time just a couple of frames. Actually, let's just make it 30 frames. So I'm gonna hold shift and press page down one, two, three times and turn the speed down. I'm gonna say 50%. And now it's going to interpolate between going 200% speed down to 50% speed, but that probably took a little bit too long. If I zoom out and play this from about here, we can see it going faster and then it slows down but after the slide, I'd like pretty much the whole slide to be at this slower speed. So maybe 30 frames is too much. I'm gonna back it up 10 frames by pressing Option Shift Left Bracket or Alt Shift Left Bracket. And that almost catches it, but I think I'm gonna back both of these keyframes up just a little bit. It'll start slowing down sooner. And then say right about here is where I want it to jump back into 200% speed. So I'll set a keyframe again at 50%, and then go forward maybe 20 frames again, set this to 200, and then play through that. So now I have fast speed, slow down, and then speed up again. All right, and I could even easy ease these to make that transition a little bit smoother. 
So nice and smooth, and then we're gonna go forward in time until he gets to the point where he clicks his heels right there. And again, I'm gonna set a keyframe at 200%. Go forward, let's say 10 frames, set that down to 25% since this is a really fast motion, and then scrub through here and see what it looks like. Now I want that heel click to be at 25%. So I'm gonna again, grab both of these keyframes and back it up until that heel click happens on or after that 25% speed. Once it happens, then I'll go a few frames forward, set another keyframe, jump 10 frames ahead, and then again set this to 200% speed. And then I'll play at that speed until the end of the clip, which actually ends right there. So actually, let's turn it down to 100% so we have a little bit more of that clip before it just freezes. But let's play this back and see what it looks like now. So fast speed, slow down, speed up again, super slow, and speed up. Okay, so my timing is where I want it, but if we zoom into right here and take a look, especially around his heels, you can see that there's quite a bit of artifacting going on, and this is because Time Warp is trying to generate information where it was obscured by his legs. There was no frame where you could see behind this part of his leg, and it's having a hard time deciding what should actually be displayed. We're getting some of that artifacting on his arm as well. Now, unfortunately, there's only so much you can do to fix this without actually having to go in and rotoscope out your subject so that it's really able to distinguish between the foreground and background. But we do have some controls to modify what this looks like. So vector detail is a setting that's kind of going to increase or decrease the amount of work it's trying to do to generate that new information. Obviously, the higher you crank this, the longer it's going to take to render and you're not always gonna get the best results. I could turn that down to five, and now it's going to look a little bit more like it's just blurring things together, which might not be a bad look, but I'm gonna reset that back to its default of 20, and then look at global smoothness and local smoothness. If I turn up the global smoothness, you can kind of see what that's doing. It almost looks like it's increasing a turbulent scale. The higher that is, the less fine the changes are in these generated pixels. If I turn it down from 500, it's kind of just moving that turbulence around, so you can play around with that setting, but we also have local smoothness. So you can play around with both of these to try and smooth out your results to get something that's a little bit more acceptable. You can also turn up or down the smoothing iterations, which may increase the quality, but also will probably increase your render time. The next option is build from one image where it's going to attempt to generate that in-between frame from one single frame instead of analyzing multiple frames and basing its result on that. This might give you a sharper image, but the distorted artifacts will also be sharper. The next option is correct luminance changes, and I'm not really seeing any, so it's really not making a difference. Next up is filtering, which is set to normal, but we could also turn this up to extreme. Again, I'm not seeing a difference in my image, but this will determine how much detail there is in the filtering of the generated image. It definitely will increase your render time, so if you're not seeing a benefit to it, leave it at normal. The error threshold and block size also manipulate how the generated parts of the image look. So if I turn that error threshold up, then it's going to allow more threshold for error, or if I turn it way down below a value of one, then it's going to have much less of an error and produce a different result. Now, the block size is kind of how much of the image it's looking at and generating new information from. It's kind of like the resolution of those new generated pixels. So if I leave the error threshold at one and turn the block size down to its minimum of four, that distortion is gonna be a little bit less noticeable. Next up we have weighting, and this is where we can pull the red, green, or blue channels to help influence how this is being generated. So you can play around with the balance of all three of these to see if you can come up with a better result, depending on what your subject was shot on top of. If it was shot on top of a blue background like the sky, then you might be able to play with the weighting to get something a little bit more acceptable. That's it for the tuning section. Next up is motion blur. Time Warp can actually generate motion blur that looks pretty good. By default, it's set to automatic, but I'm gonna change this to manual because then I can change the shutter angle and samples to whatever I want. A shutter angle of 180 is pretty natural, but if I turn this up to 360, it's really going to exaggerate how much motion blur there is, and that can help with hiding some of those artifacts. The shutter samples is how many times it's going to generate new frames to create this smooth motion blur. So the higher the shutter samples, the smoother it will be. I'm gonna turn it up to 16 to show you that that's much smoother than five, but this comes at a cost of render speed. But let me play that back so you can see what a difference that motion blur has on the overall image. 
So there you go, we have motion blur now on the footage, but if you think about it, if you're slowing this footage down, you're probably not gonna want to have motion blur because footage that was shot at a high frame rate typically does not have much, if any, motion blur visible. So this might be something that you wanna keyframe. On these moments that you're speeding up, you could artificially introduce motion blur to make it look like this was happening faster when you shot it. So maybe I'll turn the shutter angle down to 180 and just for render speed, I'm gonna turn this down to eight and then I'll keyframe it off and on to go along with my speed change. I'll set a keyframe on the shutter angle, go forward to where we're slowing down into slow-mo and turn this shutter angle down to zero. That's effectively turning the motion blur off. And then I'll just line that up with all of the time changes. So here we go, we have motion blur happening on the faster parts, and then during the slow-mo moments, we don't really have any motion blur other than what was already there in camera. Now, like I said at the beginning, this footage is less than ideal because it was only shot at 25 frames per second, so there's not a lot of information to work with. Shooting at 60 frames per second or even 30 would give us a better result, but just like anything else, if you need to do slow-mo, then shooting your footage at a high frame rate is the best way to get clean results. Now this next section of matte layer, matte channel, and warp layer allow you to make much more controlled adjustments to your image. So if I were to rotoscope this guy out using maybe the roto brush, I could set that as my matte layer and use the alpha channel from that layer to tell time warp this is the foreground object or the subject of my scene so that it can differentiate between it and the background. And that can make for cleaner results, but it's definitely time consuming. We have a warp layer, and this is where you can use motion vectors from any other layer that you choose. So if you applied time warp to say a 3D render and you had generated a motion vectors pass, you could select that here and use it to help time warp know exactly how to blur the image. And if all of those are filled out, you can choose what view you're looking at, the map, the foreground or the background, or just leaving it at the final render. Finally, we have source crops. If you're seeing any kind of artifacting around the outside edges of the frame, then you can use this to crop on any edge of your comp. But all it's doing is repeating the pixels based on how far in you're cropping. So at 11, it's starting here and just repeating the pixels to the left. So that might not be something you actually want. Maybe you could turn it up to one just to fill in the edge if you are getting artifacts. But I don't need to do that in this particular instance. But with that, we've covered all of the controls for Time Warp. It's a very complex effect and allows you to make some very controlled adjustments. One thing to think about is that you don't have to apply this to the entire clip at once. You could create, say, a garbage mat around the subject to isolate it, and that way Time Warp is only going to analyze the pixels within that garbage mask, and then you could composite that on top of the background. Obviously every shot is different, but breaking up the footage however you can may help Time Warp with some of those artifacting issues. But that's everything you need to know about Time Warp. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this tutorial, then check out the other ones here on my YouTube channel. And if you like my teaching style, then definitely check out my longer form content on Skillshare and School of Motion. And if you wanna support more tutorials like this one, check out my Patreon. You can find links for all that stuff in the description of this video.